many of the organometallic reactions that we have looked at have some additional ligands that go along with the metal. And so, when the reaction is studied, people have also found that the supporting ligand which is present on the metal plays an important role. One can notionally divide the effect a ligand has into a steric effect and an electronic effect. Though as we shall see in later slides that this division is partially artificial. So, let us take a look at what ligands or which ligands would have any significant steric effect. If you recollect some of the initial ligands that we have looked at have got carbon monoxide or a cyanide or a nitric oxide on the metal atom and these exert a very significant electronic effect. They are pi accepting electron withdrawing and deplete the metal of electron density. But on the steric side, they do not appear to have any significant influence. So, I would group the ligands into three major categories. One is a group where you have a single atom like an oxo group M double bond O. So, this would also belong to this particular category nitro nitrosyls, cyanides and carbon monoxide. And the next group of ligands are those like phosphines, carbenes, N heterocyclic carbenes which can exert a significant amount of steric influence through the presence of bulky R groups which are located either on the phosphorus as in the case of phosphines or on the nitrogen atom as in the case of N heterocyclic carbenes. So, the third group which really is consisting of only one ligand which is the hydride uh, is interesting because it has some unique steric properties which we shall discuss towards the end of this lecture. So, now let us try and see how we can understand or quantify this steric effect. It seems to be fairly easy. In many cases in inorganic chemistry, we uh, approximate a anion to a sphere and get a radius for that anion and use that as a measure of the steric influence of the anion. So, we might say P f 6 minus is a large anion whereas, chloride C l minus is a small anion and so on. So, can we use a radius for ligands or do we have to take a two dimensional projection like an angle or do we have to use a three dimensional property like a volume. These are as you can see each one of these has got some difficulties and so they are nebulous parameters in chemistry and so they introduce some amount of difficulty in this whole subject of quantification. But the initial work that was done was done with uh, angle parameter. So, that was developed by Tolman. To so, it is called Tolman's cone angle popularly it is referred to as Tolman's cone angle and later on a buried volume has been estimated which is basically a three dimensional uh, solid cone that has been uh, used to model the ligand. Now, one should not think that this particular difficulty is unique to organometallic chemistry. In fact, this is a problem in inorganic chemistry in general. Even if you take the van der Waals radius which apparently is a simple concept or should be easy to obtain for most of the elements, it, it is in fact not available for many elements. The covalent radius and the ionic radius have all got some problems associated with the type of measurements that we do in order to obtain them. Very often there are non-spherical distributions of the electron cloud and in the presence of a second anion or a second atom in the presence in, it, in the close vicinity, a uh, ion might change its shape and assume a very different distribution of the electron density around it. So, these are problems which are associated in general chemistry which make it 
both exciting, challenging and also complex. So, let us take a look at Tolman's cone angle and this is primarily developed for phosphenes. So, we noted in the initial lectures when we talked about triaryl or trialkyl phosphenes that the steric property of the phosphine and its electronic property can be varied because of the presence of different R groups on the phosphorus. Although it is not as good as carbon monoxide, the variability of the steric parameter gives it a significant advantage in chemistry. So, the steric influence is something that we need to quantify if we have to use it with some predictive power. So, Tolman initially approximated it to this two dimensional cone angle and the way he did it was as follows. He projected the ligand onto a flat surface and looked at the angle that would be subtended at the metal atom. So, this angle theta at the metal atom is a measure of the steric influence of the ligand and this is very clear that you can in fact take the outermost points of the ligand and draw a line to the metal and measure this angle using a simple protractor. In fact, he did it in a very simple way. He took, he made molecular models and measured it using a protractor. Now, what is the rationale behind this type of an approximation? In fact, it is difficult to estimate a uh, in a very three dimension in a very good fashion the volume that is occupied by the ligand and that is because some of the ligands are flat like a triaryl phosphine has got three phenyl groups or three arene groups which are reasonably flat and so the way you orient it could mean a big uh, could change the volume that it is occupying so, an approximation would be to project it on the surface using the best orientation that it would like to have. So, a second difficulty that Tolman encountered was the following. The angle that is subtended by the ligand at the metal can change and how can it change? Imagine the same ligand approaching the metal to in a closer fashion. If m and m dashed if there are two different metals and if one metal is a better pi donor, then the phosphine might approach the metal atom to a greater degree. When it comes closer, this distance is shorter and this angle theta 2 becomes greater. So, this variability it makes a big difference to the cone angle. Theta, the cone angle is dependent on the metal and that is because it is dependent on the metal ligand distance. So, this geometric dependence is quite obvious and it is easy to see and Tolman decided that the simple solution was to fix the distance for all for measuring the Tolman's cone angle, he would fix the distance at 2.28 angstroms. So, this was a when he made a model, he would keep it at a distance of 2.28 angstroms or the, uh, the appropriate distance and then he would measure the angle that is subtended at the metal atom. So, using this type of a model, he measured various cone angles and these are listed here for you to see. It is obvious that the hydrogen, if you have pH, pH 3, that is the P H 3 which has 3 hydrogens on the phosphorus will have the least cone angle, smallest cone angle and that is indeed the least in this list. And you can see that as you increase the bulk of the R group, the angle that you subtend at the metal becomes larger and larger. So, the largest in, in fact is an angle of 182 degrees that is uh, that is the angle Tolman's cone angle measured for Tris tertiary butyl phosphine. So, what does that mean 182 degrees? It really means that on one side of the metal, if you have the phosphorus atom, one side of the metal is completely blocked by this 
large ligand that is present. So, even though the phosphorus is having three ligands which are apparently pointed away from the metal, the area that is the area that is occupied by this ligand when it is projected the, on the on a flat surface would indicate that about 182 degrees would be the cone angle of this particular ligand. So, this is in fact an interesting uh, observation and you can see that many times it would be impossible to put more than two ligands around the metal. So, how does it matter? It is exactly the dissociation constants of the metal complexes that one is talking about. Here is a system where you have um, a series of uh, series of four ligands connected to a nickel atom nickel 0. So, nickel would like to have four ligands in order to have an 18 electron configuration, but because of the large cone angles that are present at the phosphorus, it is not possible to pack four of them. So, as you increase as you increase the size of the ligand, one tends to dissociate this uh, dissociate one of the ligands easily. So, you end up dissociating 1 L and uh, this is shown here in this um, uh, slide as a dissociation constant is marked here. And so, this increases as you increase the size the um, the dissociation constant keeps increasing in this direction. So, as the bulk increases the dissociation constant also increases. So, let us take a look at a larger metal does it make a difference. Surprisingly, in the case of nickel we noted that the dissociation constant increases. In the case of palladium where the metal is much larger the effect is still retained. So, in other words as you increase the size of the ligand which is attached to the metal atom you tend to form more and more of the dissociated complexes. And in fact, for this com this ligand the, the metal complex that is present in solution is a PDL 2 system. So, although they are in equilibrium the amount of the dissociated complex turns out to be more and more as you increase the size of the ligand. So, it makes a difference in chemistry if you want to do chemistry with the PDL 2 complex, then you would like to have more of the large ligands in solution. So, in the, and uh, this turns out to be very crucial or very critical in the case of this cobalt complex, which is an extreme example, where you have four isopropoxy groups, four ligands, where phosphorus has three isopropoxy groups around it and the bulk of this isopropoxy group is so much that the cobalt would like to have which would like to have a square planar geometry tends to be tetrahedral in this case. So, why is this so? First of all, let us take a look at the D 8 complex which is cobalt 1 is a D 8 system. and why does it prefer to have a square planar geometry and not an octahedral complex? And that refers to the difficulty of hybridizing the central metal atom to have D 2 S P 3. If you want to have an octahedral geometry, you would have to mix 2 D's and 3 P orbitals and 1 S orbital and that will give you the octahedral uh, complex. Whereas, if you only want four ligands you can manage with D S P 2 that releases one of the p orbitals from being involved in bonding. And when you involve a high energy p orbital in these cases it is usually 3 D 4 S and 4 P which we are talking about. So, if you leave out one p orbital then you do not have to include the energy that is required for utilizing that high energy orbital in bond formation. So, it is better for the molecule to remain in a square planar geometry rather than assume this octahedral geometry. So, that is the reason why you would like to have 
uh, many of the D 8 complexes are uh, preferring a square planar geometry rather than an octahedral geometry. Now, in this particular case, the major difference that we are talking about is really not octahedral versus tetrahedral or square planar, but it is tetrahedral versus square planar. It is this difference that is very striking. We know that the complex would like to have a tetra a square planar geometry, but in this case it assumes a tetrahedral geometry because the angle between the ligands when you have a tetrahedral geometry is 109 degrees. Whereas, if you have a square planar geometry, it would be 90 degrees. So, this, dif this difference in the square planar geometry, it is the square planar geometry, the angle is 90 degrees. In the tetrahedral geometry, it is 109 degrees and this larger angle is preferred by this cobalt tetrachis phosphine complex and that is because of the large size of the ligand. It would rather have a tetrahedral geometry with poor pi bonding rather than a square planar geometry. It is well known that this square planar geometry has got very good pi interactions whereas, the tetrahedral geometry has got weaker pi interactions. So, if you have a ligand like cyanide which would not require a large area that it needs to occupy, then it would rather go for a square planar geometry. And in fact, the large size of the ligand is what is forcing the complex to have the tetrahedral geometry in this case. So, Tolman's cone angle is something that is very important, but very often it is important for us to realize that it has a stereo electronic influence. And there are two ways in which we can call it uh, have as something that has a uh, subtle electronic influence. First of all, if you have four small ligands around the metal, then they can approach the metal much closer. So, the metal ligand bond distance would be much better if you have smaller ligands. So, you the cone angle at the same time this also has another effect and, which, and that is the fact that the cone angle would automatically increase. So, if you have a small ligand then you can have a larger cone angle surprisingly because the ligand approaches the metal to a greater degree. So, and this is something which is quite obvious. If you know the chemistry behind the ligands, you know that there is pi bonding, you know that there is going to be a difference, but because of the complexity of the situation, one has to approximate to, to a, a fixed distance. And so, uh, the distance between the metal and ligand is always fixed at 2.28 angstroms and the cone angle is measured using a protractor. So, unfortunately, this was done with models to start with. But soon, uh, many crystallographic, many crystal structures were available, and it was possible to derive the angle from crystallographic data. And uh, in a very important and a comprehensive paper, Mingos showed that the distribution of various phosphorus ligands around the around a metal atom can be st studied using crystallography. You can derive the cone angle using crystallography. And when he plotted the, uh, the complexes, the cone angle of the complexes uh, as a histogram, he found that, that there was a distribution of the cone angles and the mean was approximately the same place at uh, in this particular instance, it is close to 145 degrees, which is what is assigned as a cone angle for triphenyl phosphine. So, it is exactly what one would have uh, estimated using a simple protractor as a, as a simple model and what you get from crystallography is approximately the same. So, this tells you that the methodology used by uh, Tolman was, uh, was more or less correct and this gives you a more accurate way of determining the cone angle. But this also brought to light the fact that there can be complications. 
the complications came when uh, Coville studied the cone angles of uh, trialkyl phosphides. In this particular instance, you have some variability in the R groups in the way in which the R groups are oriented. So, if you have two R groups which are oriented towards the metal ligand axis, if this is the metal ligand axis and let us just mark it with a different color, so that it is obvious. So, this is the metal ligand axis and if the R groups are pointed towards the metal ligand axis, then the angle would be smaller. If the R groups are pointing away from the metal ligand axis, then the angle would be larger. So, what he found was that if you use a ligand like P O M E 3, this is particularly for P O M E 3. So, when you measure it for P O M E 3, you find that there are two distributions which are quite obvious in this particular figure. So, in other words, you will end up with two cone angles for these for, for these ligands, one which is approximately 116 degrees, another which is approximately 130 degrees. So, this depends on the environment in which the ligand is present and so it is uh, so it's possible to have two different angles for a single ligand. So, this is not possible when you have a measurement done using models, you would assume the most favorable geometry or the maximum possible angle that the ligand can uh, occupy. Now, I want to move on to another topic and that is the utilization of not cone angles, but what was introduced by Nolan as a buried volume concept. And this came about because they were studying n heterocyclic carbenes and n heterocyclic carbenes have become extremely popular because of the various reactions which they catalyze and the unique electronic properties that they influence that they that they have. So, the steric properties of n heterocyclic carbenes have also captured the attention of people because the R group on the nitrogen makes a big difference. The R group on the nitrogen makes a big difference on, on the reaction. So, in one shot n heterocyclic carbenes are having a significant electronic effect and a steric effect and NHC are called superheroes in the ligand field. Now, let us take a look at the n heterocyclic car most popular n heterocyclic carbene and as pictured here is a imidazole based n heterocyclic carbene. You can see that much of the ligand is reasonably flat and if one rotates the ligand around this axis, if one rotates the ligand around this axis, one would end up with a conformation which is indicated on my right side, on the right side of the screen. So, it is obvious that if the angle, the Tolman's cone angle that you would obtain for this ligand would depend very much on how you orient the ligand with respect to this axis. So, this does not make a lot of sense and so, Nolan, Steve Nolan who was working on many n heterocyclic carbenes devised this buried volume concept. What he did was to extend the Tolman's cone angle by assuming that you have a fixed metal carbon bond length and that is about 2 angstroms. He fixed this bond length as 2 angstroms and he took a sphere which is 3.5 angstroms. So, here is a sphere, imaginary sphere. This is an imaginary sphere, imaginary sphere around the metal atom and on this imaginary sphere, you position a carbene and you measure the volume that is occupied by this carbene. So, this is the volume that is occupied by the carbene and that volume is actually a solid cone and this volume 
you, uh, you can estimate a percentage of the volume occupied by this ligand vis a vis the total volume of this 3.5 angstrom cube sphere that is available around the metal. So, this percentage could be used as a measure of the uh, of the size of the ligand. So, this buried volume concept was introduced uh, by Stephen Nolan is quite interesting in that it now makes the two dimensional cone angle introduced by Tolman into a three dimensional volume. Now, you can do this for phosphenes, you can do it for any ligand that you can think of. You just estimate the volume that is occupied by the ligand in an imaginary sphere of 3.5 angstroms. Now, it is obvious that this 3.5 and this 2 angstroms that is used by uh, Nolan are two arbitrary parameters that have been introduced and this is unavoidable because of the difficulty in quantifying the various metals that are involved and the various carbon metal distances that are present. But nevertheless, it turns out to be a useful feature and you can see, you can read this communication in order to get a greater insight into this particular concept. So, let us take a look at a real life molecule. Here is a real life molecule where you have two large aryl groups which are attached to the nitrogen. If you look at a two dimensional picture of this molecule, you might think that this is in fact a flat structure and uh, this is a nickel 2 complex, nickel 2 plus complex in which you have two carbenes in a square planar geometry and you notice that this is a, a system which might have a planar structure. Let us take a look at this molecule in three dimensions. Here is the molecule and you can see the two chlorine atoms are, are present and the chlorine atoms are green and I have oriented the molecule in such a way that you are looking at the molecule through the nickel chlorine axis. And you will notice that although this molecule is perfectly square planar, the, the volume that is occupied by the ligand is significantly large. And in fact, in a ball and stick model, you are able to see the nickel and the chlorine atoms very clearly. But if you use a different, a different way of, um, a different way of looking at it, here is a space filling model, space filling model of the same molecule, and you will notice that you can hardly see the nickel atom inside this uh, big blob of a molecule, which is mostly showing only the two carbenes which are present. And you can see the chlorines at one particular point where you see it through the nickel chlorine bond. Let us go back to the two dimensional representation now. This is the molecule that we have just looked at in 3D uh, a few seconds ago and this is the picture that we looked at. And you can see that the bulk of the ligand is extremely the volume that is occupied by the ligand is extremely large and this is not conveyed by the two dimensional structure. So, it is not possible to use a, a two dimensional projection as the cone angle to get a proper idea of the volume that is used, used up by the ligand. So, the cone, the solid cone and the volume that is occupied by the ligand is a better representation. And in fact, here we have a few representative examples measured for copper and silver. I have shown you two different metals purely to indicate the fact that once again in the crystal structure, if you measure the actual buried volumes, they do differ from metal to metal. But nevertheless, the, the accepted buried volume percentage is taken as the one where you have a fixed distance of 2 angstroms and a fixed imaginary sphere of 3.5 angstroms. So, the percentage buried volume for copper uh, from crystallography here you have a list 
that is available for copper and silver and you can see that there is a slight difference between the two. Now, let us take a look at the uh, influence of this buried volume and the influence it has in chemistry. So, here I have a bond dissociation energy and you can see that the bond dissociation energy is uh, related to the cone angle. If you have a large buried volume, percentage buried volume, then the dissociation energy is small. When you have tertiary butyl groups on the nitrogen, the buried volume turns out to be significantly smaller and that is uh, that is given here. Whereas, if you have a mesetyl group, because the mesetyl group is flat, it occupies less space, you can see that that has got a larger uh, bond dissociation energy indicating a better metal carbon bond strength. So, the percentage buried volume is related to the cone angle and is a good measure of the steric parameter of the ligand. So, at this point, let us just summarize what we have been talking about. Approximations are required in order to quantify the steric effects. We have seen both in the cone angle that we that Tolman measured and in Nolan's buried volume concept, there was a approximation made and that approximation was to fix the metal ligand bond distance in order to get some consistency in the buried volumes and the cone angles that you report in the literature. The percentage volume that is occupied uh, by the ligand is a better estimate of the steric influence of the ligand. And in, in one can in fact use crystallography to if you have a large number of complexes, it would be easy to have a distribution of the cone angles or the buried volumes and make an estimate a better estimate of the, the buried volume that you should use in order to calculate any property of the molecule. So, uh, we should also remember that there is a variation in the type of the volume that a ligand occupies and it really depends on the environment that is available for the ligand. So, in the case of tritris methoxyphosphine phosphite, in the case of the tris methoxyphosphite, the crystallographic data clearly showed that there are two cone angles that are possible for this particular ligand. This is very much akin to what we see with a balloon. If you want to measure it at the vernier calipers, then the size of the balloon depends on how much we squeeze the balloon with the calipers. So, one cannot have a unique size for the balloon when you measure it with the calipers. Similarly, the uh, cone angle you can have a, you can have a similar situation and you can have variations in the cone angle also in the buried volume also. Re in recent times, it has been possible to estimate this cone angle or this uh, volume using some computer programs and these are useful when you do not have a crystal structure and when it is cumbersome to make a molecular model in order to estimate the cone angle. So, here are two references to papers where in fact, you can use the web in order to estimate the uh, buried volume of a ligand in this particular uh, website and you can also have uh, cone angles measured automatically. So, let us take a look at uh, the hydride which I mentioned as the other unique situation in chemistry. Hydrogen always poses a problem when you want to generalize uh, some concepts, hydrogen sticks out as a unique uh, element and in this particular case, it is a unique ligand and if you ask the question, what is its size? It is difficult to give a proper answer for this question. Here is a molecule which I have shown for you where a ruthenium, uh, a ruthenium atom is, this is a ruthenium atom which is pictured here. Let me just show you here is a ruthenium atom which is complex to a, an aromatic ring. So, this is an aromatic ring system that is available 
uh, for uh, for this metal to complex. So, this is the uh, complex that we are talking about. You have two nitrogens and that is a bipyridine and this ruthenium is coordinated to a hydride and you can see that this is a typical piano stool geometry that the ruthenium is uh, occupying. You have a uh, you have a situation where you have a flat stool which is sitting on three legs two nitrogen and one hydrogen and this hydrogen is occupying a, a reasonable amount of space next to the ruthenium and here is an another example and this example I am going to choose a rhodium complex and in the rhodium complex we have triphenylphosphines attached to the rhodium and because it is rhodium 1 you have a ligand you have a ligand which is a hydride and in the two complexes differ in a very simple fashion and that is in one case you have 4 this is tetrachis triphenylphosphine and this one has got 3 triphenylphosphines and the fourth ligand is in fact a carbon monoxide. So, let us take a look at the complex in 3 D and see how these complexes fare. So, this is a complex which is the carbon monoxide complex and you can see that you can see that the complex has got a hydrogen and a carbon monoxide in an axial position in a trigonal bipyramidal geometry and the three equatorial positions are occupied by the three triphenylphosphines. So, this complex is in fact having five ligands and the five ligands occupy the five points of a trigonal bipyramid around the rhodium and so this seems to be a very reasonable complex too just like the ruthenium complex that I just showed you. Now, if you measure the angles around the if you measure the angles around the rhodium you can let us just measure this angle here I have a phosphorus a rhodium and a phosphorus and this angle turns out to be close to 115 degrees or it should have been close to 120 degrees and here is the second angle and this is 116 degrees. So, you can see that these angles are close to 120 degrees. So, now let us move on to another complex which I mentioned and this complex has got four triphenylphosphines and these four triphenylphosphines are almost occupying the vertices of a tetrahedron. So, where is the hydrogen present? The hydrogen is in fact on one of the faces of this tetrahedron and you can see it right here. You can see the hydrogen that is sitting on the rhodium and that is on the face of a tetrahedral tetrahedron that is formed by the four phosphorus atoms which are linked to the rhodium atom. So, you can see that the hydrogen is really sterically accommodating and it is not demanding the fifth position in a five vertex geometry around the rhodium. So, it is almost as if there are only four ligands around the rhodium and the hydrogen is occupying a small place on the surface or on the sphere of the rhodium atom. So, let us proceed with this um, and let us take a look at the angles that I was talking about. Here is the case where the rhodium has got one carbon monoxide and three phosphines and the hydrogen is occupying a unique position that is the apical position on the TBP geometry. And in the case of the tetrachis triphenylphosphine complex, the hydrogen is occupying one of the faces of the tetrahedron and the four phosphorus ligands seem to be occupying all the space space around the rhodium. So, the angle around the rhodium 
is almost close to phosphorus rhodium phosphorus angle is close to 109 degrees. And if you uh, see it closely, this is both angles appear to be the two angles that are marked are close to 109 degrees. So, now in the remaining time, I would like to discuss some of the electronic effects that the ligands um, that the ligands exert and we have already discussed in the case of both n heterocyclic carbenes and in the case of phosphines the type of electronic parameterization that can be done. In fact, Tolman who devised the Tolman's cone angle was the same person who devised Tolman's electronic parameter. And this is a quantification that is based on a simple spectroscopic measurement. If you take nickel tetracarbonyl and substitute one of the carbon monoxides with a ligand the ligand of choice that you want to measure the electronic parameter for, then the three carbon monoxides that are on the other side of the nickel change this CO stretching frequency depending on how much electron density is available on the nickel. So, if you have a large amount of electron density on the nickel, then the carbon monoxide stretching frequency goes down. So, the electron density that is given to the metal is inversely proportional to the stretching frequency. Now, you will have two stretching frequencies of for the three carbon monoxides if you have a C 3 V symmetry around the metal and so you would have to take the average of the C O stretch and this is what you have as the Tolman's electronic parameter. Now, it is also possible to use carbon 13 NMR spectroscopy and these two parameters what you measure using Tolman's spectroscopic parameter the carbon monoxide stretching frequency and the carbon 13 chemical shift are, appear to be related and people have correlated the two and have found for the same ligand if you plot the Tolman's electronic parameter and the carbon 13 uh, spectral data they are correlated. Now, this carbon 13 uh, spectral data is very much dependent on the electron density around the carbon and the carbene carbon uh, has got this unique chemical shift around 180 ppm or parts per million and that shifts to an upfield region when it is coordinated to the metal. And that uh, the chemical shift that you observe for the carbene carbon when it is attached to palladium a palladium 2 bromide complex is what is used as a standard for this carbon 13 measure of the electronic parameter. So, here I have given for you a couple of different n heterocyclic carbenes and the electronic effect they, they exert and you can see that that depends on the both the angle and the uh, both the angle and the electron density that the carbon uh, exerts. Now, uh, the question comes up can we do uh, an estimate of any property for the metal complex using only electronic effects. Because we mentioned that steric parameters are in fact stereo electronic can we just use the electronic parameter to get an estimate of any particular property. Now, these properties could be metal ligand bond distances it could be a uh, bond dissociation energy or it could even be a kinetic parameter as the reaction as the rate of a reaction in which these ligands are present. Now, what we what has been shown in the literature is that this property just the electronic property is not sufficient to model any of the uh, ligands influence completely. So, in the case of uh, the E C W model that is used by Drago. Uh, Drago model the electronic influence of a ligand using the electrostatic effect and the covalent effect and he uh, described these parameters estimated these parameters for various ligands and this does not quantitatively reproduce the property of a metal complex. Some properties are reproduced, but some are not and this is primarily because there is no parameterization 
for the steric property. So, to in this lecture we have actually dealt with two different parameters, steric parameters and electronic parameters and it is quite obvious from this particular data that I have shown you that the electronic parameter alone is not sufficient to model the property of a molecule, any property and uh, the model that has been successful that has received reasonable amount of uh, acclaim is what is known as a quantitative analysis of ligand effects Q A L E. So, Q A L E is an acronym that is uh, available for this particular method developed by Gehring and Proc. These two people have developed a simple equation which relates a property, any property of the molecule to uh, the electronic and the steric parameters. Chi is an electronic parameter that uh, uh, we need to plug in and theta is a cone angle uh, and it is a steric parameter. You will notice that theta appears twice in this equation. One is theta into b and another is, uh, is the parameter c into theta minus theta s t. Theta s t refers to the limit of the angle uh, which is like the steric limit uh, after which there is some influence from the steric parameter. And um, uh, the E A R is the number of aryl groups present on the ligand. Very often an aromatic parameter is required uh, in order to model the ligand properly. E is of course, a simple constant that is added to get a proper fit for the property and these parameters. Now, uh, the last paper that was uh, published in this area is, uh, is in 1996 by Proc and Gehring and this gives you a good summary of the many different uh, nuances that are involved in utilizing this quantitative analysis of ligand FX model. Now, uh, let me just illustrate how this quail can be used. Here is a plot of this dissociation energy. The dissociation energy is a simple loss of carbon monoxide in this 5 coordinated complex and this rate, this rate is dependent on the cone angle of the ligand L. Cone angle of the ligand L is plotted in this x axis and the log k is plotted along the y axis. And you can see that up to 160 degrees there is no influence of the cone angle on the rate of dissociation. But after 160 degrees, the larger the cone angle, the faster the dissociation. So, the dissociation becomes more easy as you have a bulkier L. And this is quite obvious, but what is interesting is that the quail model incorporates a threshold cone angle so that you can in fact, model this threshold steric parameter that is available for each reaction. Now, it is obvious that this is reaction dependent and for this particular reaction theta s t would be 160 degrees. Theta s t will be 160 degrees in the equation that we just showed you earlier. So, here is the equation uh, for uh, displacement reaction where benzylidine acetone which is shown for you here is replaced by two ligands and the nature of these ligands can affect this dissociation and the del H for this particular reaction has been measured. The heat liberated when you replace the benzylidine acetone with these two ligands and it has been shown that there is in fact an influence of the steric parameter and there is an influence of the electronic parameter and also the aryl groups. If you have aryl groups on the ligand L, then it turns out that that has got a better, uh, a better, a larger dissociation. If you have an aryl group, it has a different uh, heat of uh, reaction for this uh, particular exchange reaction. So, you can see that if you have a, 
a chi which is uh, which is indicated here the Tolman's electronic parameter then that has a significant influence on the del h and the larger the chi the larger the heat that is generated in this reaction. So, if you uh, can measure various parameters like bond distances, bond energies and you can relate them with the steric parameter and the electronic parameter it becomes a useful exercise when you want to design a new ligand in order to have a better reaction. So, uh, in fact, in the literature it has been it has been shown that equilibrium constants, p k values or uh, electrode potentials all of them can be related to using this quail equation. In a recent paper it has been shown for um, uh, the oxo transfer reaction in uh, molybdenum 6 complex that you can quantitate the effect of the ligand using you can quantitate the effect of the ligand using this quail equation. So, let me just conclude by uh, talking about the difficulties that we have in steric quantifying steric and electronic parameters. Uh, steric parameters can be obtained in a reasonably good fashion using crystallographic data. This is in fact a great advantage, but you have to use it with caution. And secondly, electronic effects are also measured very accurately using spectroscopic data. But if you want to have predictive value in chemistry, it turns out that you have to use both steric and electronic effects.